The Quest for Cosmic Justice by Thomas Sowell This book consists of four chapters and is 189 pages long. The following material appears on the dust jacket of the book. This book is about the great moral issues underlying many of the headline-making political controversies of our times. It is not a comforting book, but a book about disturbing and dangerous trends. The quest for cosmic justice shows how confused conceptions of justice end up promoting injustice, how confused conceptions of equality end up promoting inequality, and how the tyranny of social visions prevents many people from confronting the actual consequences of their own beliefs and policies. Those consequences include the steady and dangerous erosion of fundamental principles of freedom, amounting to a quiet repeal of the American Revolution. The quest for cosmic justice is the summation of a lifetime of study and thought about where we as a society are headed and why we need to change course before we do irretrievable damage. Contents Chapter 1, The Quest for Cosmic Justice Chapter 2, The Mirage of Equality Chapter 3, The Tyranny of Visions Chapter 4, The Quiet Repeal of the American Revolution Best-selling author Thomas Sowell has been on the faculties of leading universities across the country, an economist in the corporate world and in government, and a scholar-in-residence at three think tanks. His books have been translated into nine languages, and his essays have appeared in The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Time, Newsweek, Forbes, and Fortune, and are syndicated to 150 newspapers. For the past two decades, he has been a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University. Preface General principles, such as justice or equality, are often passionately invoked in the course of arguing about the issues of the day, but such terms usually go undefined and unexamined. Often much more could be gained by scrutinizing what we ourselves mean by such notions than by trying to convince or overwhelm others. If we understood what we were really saying, in many cases we might not say it, or if we did, we might have a better chance of making our reasons understood by those who disagree with us. The heady rush of rhetoric and visions are the stuff of everyday politics and everyday media discussion. That makes it all the more important that, at some point, we step back and examine what it all means underneath the froth or glitter. This book is an attempt to do that. The ideas discussed here took shape over a long period of time. The title essay evolved out of a paper I gave in San Gallen, Switzerland in 1982 on trade-offs and social justice. By 1984, it was recast and elaborated at great length in another paper called Social Justice Reconsidered, which was circulated to various people around the country, including Milton Friedman and Mankur Olson. Professor Friedman's typically incisive criticisms were followed by the opinion that it is well worth the effort required to put it in shape. Professor Olson's comments were likewise critical and perhaps not quite as encouraging. I, too, understood the difficulties of that draft, which was academic and radically different in form from what appears in this book. Over the years, social justice reconsidered evolved into the quest for cosmic justice, completely recast yet again, but still not finished a decade later. Nor was it certain that it ever would be finished, given the various other projects I was involved in. However, in the spring of 1996, some particularly sophomoric remarks by one of my Stanford colleagues not only provoked my anger but also convinced me that there was a real need to untangle the kind of confusions that could lead any sensible adult to say the things he had said, and which all too many other people were saying. I went home and immediately resumed work on the essay on cosmic justice, writing it now for the general public rather than for an academic audience. By the autumn of 1996, the new version was completed, and I presented The Quest for Cosmic Justice as a lecture in New Zealand. Much to my pleasant surprise, large excerpts from it were published in the country's leading newspapers. This press coverage, as well as the enthusiastic reception of the talk by a non-academic audience, convinced me that this was something that the general public would understand, 
perhaps more readily than some academics who are locked into the intellectual fashions of the day. The other essays in this book also evolved over a period of years and within a similar framework of thought that now gives them a collective coherence even though they were written to stand alone individually. The central ideas in Visions of War and Peace first appeared in an article of that title that I published in 1987 in the British journal Encounter. The current and much briefer version is now a section in the essay The Tyranny of Visions. The generosity of Milton Friedman and the late Menker Olson in criticizing the earlier academically oriented paper of mine is much appreciated, but of course they share no responsibility for any shortcomings of the present very different essay aimed at a more general audience. In a truly just world, I would also have to acknowledge my debt to my colleague whose sloppy thinking galvanized me into action. However, I shall not do so by name, in deference to collegiality and to the libel laws in a litigious society. Thomas Sowell, Rose and Milton Friedman Senior Fellow, Hoover Institution, Stanford University. Chapter 1 The Quest for Cosmic Justice Justice, if only we knew what it was. Socrates one of the few subjects on which we all seem to agree is the need for justice. But our agreement is only seeming because we mean such different things by the same word. Whatever moral principle each of us believes in, we call justice. So we are only talking in a circle when we say that we advocate justice, unless we specify just what conception of justice we have in mind. This is especially so today, when so many advocate what they call social justice, often with great passion, but with no definition. All justice is inherently social. Can someone on a desert island be either just or unjust? Inequalities and Injustices If social justice can be distinguished from any other conception of justice, it is probably by its reaction against the great inequalities of income and wealth which we see all around us. But reactions against such inequalities are not limited to those who proclaim social justice. It was not a radical writer, but free market economist Milton Friedman, who referred to gross inequities of income and wealth, which offend most of us, and declared, Few can fail to be moved by the contrast between the luxury enjoyed by some and the grinding poverty suffered by others. While such views have often been associated with the political left, many of the thinkers and writers identified as conservative have long expressed similar views, objecting not only to economic inequalities, but also to extreme inequalities of power and respect. Two centuries ago, Adam Smith, the father of laissez-faire economics, deplored not only the callousness of the rich and powerful of his day, who never look upon their inferiors as their fellow creatures, but deplored also our obsequiousness to our superiors and the foolish wonder and admiration shown toward the violence and injustice of great conquerors. While a few conservative writers here and there have tried to justify inequalities on grounds of merit, most have not. The late Nobel Prize-winning economist and free market champion Friedrich A. Hayek, for example, declared, the manner in which the benefits and burdens are apportioned by the market mechanism would, in many instances, have to be regarded as very unjust if it were the result of a deliberate allocation to particular people. The only reason he did not regard it as unjust was because the particulars of a spontaneous order cannot be just or unjust. The absence of personal intention in a spontaneous order, a cosmos, as Hayek defined it, means an absence of either justice or injustice. Nature can be neither just nor unjust, he said. Only if we mean to blame a personal creator does it make sense to describe it as unjust that somebody has been born with a physical defect or been stricken with a disease or has suffered the loss of a loved one. 
Others who share a similarly secular view are often driven to personify society in order to reintroduce concepts of moral responsibility and justice into the cosmos, seeking to rectify the tragic misfortunes of individuals and groups through collective action in the name of social justice. Yet this collective action is not limited to correcting the consequences of social decisions or other collective social action, but extends to mitigating as well the misfortunes of the physically and mentally disabled, for example. In other words, it seeks to mitigate and make more just the undeserved misfortunes arising from the cosmos as well as from society. It seeks to produce cosmic justice, going beyond strictly social justice, which becomes just one aspect of cosmic justice. As the philosopher Thomas Nagel put it, the range of possibilities or likely courses of life that are open to a given individual are limited to a considerable extent by his birth, which includes not only the social class and home environment into which he happened to be born, but also his genetic endowment. This last, especially, is clearly not social. Yet, from a moral point of view, Professor Nagel said, there is nothing wrong with the state tinkering with that distribution of life chances, which distribution does not have any moral sanctity. Thus, in this view, to provide equality of opportunity, it is necessary to compensate in some way for the unequal starting points that people occupy. The difference between Nagel and Hayek in this regard is not in their understanding of the painful inequalities that both recognize, but in their respective conceptions of justice. Even those few writers who have tried to justify inequalities on merit grounds are nevertheless conceding that inequalities are things requiring justification. Virtually no one regards these inequalities as desirable in themselves. If the world had chanced to be more equal than it is, it is hard to see who would have had any grounds for complaint, much less just grounds. Nor should we imagine that quantifiable economic differences or political and social inequalities exhaust the disabilities of the less fortunate. Affluent professional people have access to all sorts of sources of free knowledge and advice from highly educated and knowledgeable friends and relatives, and perhaps substantial financial aid in time of crisis from some of these same sources. They also tend to have greater access to those with political power whether through direct contacts or through the simple fact of being able to make an articulate presentation in terms acceptable to political elites. Moreover, the fact that the affluent tend to have the air of knowledgeable people makes them less likely to become targets for many of the swindlers who prey on the ignorant and the poor. Even in legitimate businesses, the poor pay more, as the title of a book said some years ago, because it costs more to deliver goods and services to low-income, high-crime neighborhoods where insurance and other costs are higher. In short, statistical inequalities do not begin to exhaust the advantages of the advantaged or the disadvantages of the disadvantaged. With people across virtually the entire ideological spectrum being offended by inequalities and their consequences, why do these inequalities persist? Why are we not all united in determination to put an end to them? Perhaps the most cogent explanation was that offered by Milton Friedman. A society that puts equality, in the sense of equality of outcome, ahead of freedom will end up with neither equality nor freedom. The use of force to achieve equality will destroy freedom, and the force, introduced for good purposes, will end up in the hands of people who use it to promote their own interests. Whatever the validity of this argument, and one need only think of the horrors of Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot to realize that painful possibilities are not mere fantasies, it rejects direct political equalization of economic results because the costs are judged to be too high. Still, it finds no positive virtue in inequality. But what of those who do not reject the cost as too high? Do they simply have a different assessment of those costs and risks? Or do they proceed with little or no attention to that question? A trivial example may illustrate some of the costs of correcting some kinds of inequalities and injustices. 
In San Francisco, in 1996, a relative of one of the city's supervisors telephoned a pizza company to ask to have a pizza delivered to his home. He was told that the company did not deliver pizza where he lived, which happened to be in a high-crime neighborhood. Immediately, there was an outburst of moral indignation. A law was passed decreeing that anyone who makes deliveries to the public in any part of the city must make deliveries all over the city. Here, in this simple example, we have all of the elements of the quest for cosmic justice. Since most people are not criminals, even in a high-crime neighborhood, large numbers of innocent people have various additional costs imposed on them through no fault of their own. In this case, the cost of being unable to receive deliveries of food, furniture, packages, and other things that other people take for granted elsewhere. They are treated unequally. From a cosmic perspective, this is an injustice, in the sense that, if we were creating the universe from scratch, this is not something that most of us would choose to include in it. However, unlike God at the dawn of creation, we cannot simply say, let there be equality, or let there be justice. We must begin with the universe that we were born into, and weigh the costs of making any specific change in it to achieve a specific end. We cannot simply do something whenever we are morally indignant while disdaining to consider the costs entailed. In this case, the increased costs would include dead truck drivers. In American high-crime neighborhoods, the probability that a given young man living there will be killed is greater than the probability that a given American soldier would be killed in World War II. While the odds may not be as great for someone making deliveries there, they may also not be negligible. Nor should we ignore the possibility that an outsider may attract more attention and resentment, resulting in greater risks. Once we begin to consider how many deliveries are worth how many dead truck drivers, we have abandoned the quest for cosmic justice and reduced our choices to the more human scale of weighing costs versus benefits. Across a wide spectrum of issues, the difference between seeking cosmic justice and seeking traditional justice depends on the extent to which costs are weighed. The enormous difference that this can make needs to be made explicit so that we do not keep talking past one another on something as important as justice. Cosmic justice is not simply a higher degree of traditional justice. It is a fundamentally different concept. Traditionally, justice or injustice is characteristic of a process. A defendant in a criminal case would be said to have received justice if the trial were conducted as it should be, under fair rules and with the judge and jury being impartial. After such a trial, it could be said that justice was done, regardless of whether the outcome was an acquittal or an execution. Conversely, if the trial were conducted in violation of the rules and with a judge or jury showing prejudice against the defendant, this would be considered an unfair or unjust trial, even if the prosecutor failed in the end to get enough jurors to vote to convict an innocent person. In short, traditional justice is about impartial processes rather than either results or prospects. Similar conceptions of justice or fairness extend beyond the legal system. A fair fight is one in which both combatants observe the rules, regardless of whether that leads to a draw or to a one-sided beating. Applying the same rules of baseball to all meant that Mark McGuire hit 70 home runs, while some other players hit less than 10. The career open to talents, or a level playing field, usually means that everyone plays by the same rules and is judged by the same standards. Again, if the process itself meets that standard, then no matter what the outcome, you had your chance. But this is not what is meant by those people who speak of social justice. In fact, rules and standards equally applicable to all are often deliberately set aside in pursuit of social justice. Nor are such exceptions aberrations. The two concepts are mutually incompatible. What social justice seeks to do is to eliminate undeserved disadvantages for selected groups. As in the San Francisco pizza delivery case, this is often done in disregard of the costs of this to other individuals or groups or even to the requirements of society as a whole.
When one considers a society such as Sri Lanka, where group preferences initiated in the 1950s led to decades of internal strife, escalating into bitter civil war with many atrocities, it is not purely fanciful to consider that other societies may become more polarized and contentious to everyone's ultimate detriment by similar schemes of preferential treatment for one segment of society. Intergroup relations in the United States, for example, have never been as good as they once were in Sri Lanka, nor, fortunately, are they as bad as they later became in Sri Lanka. In its pursuit of justice for a segment of society, in disregard of the consequences for society as a whole, what is called social justice might more accurately be called anti-social justice, since what consistently gets ignored or dismissed are precisely the costs to society. Such a conception of justice seeks to correct not only biased or discriminatory acts by individuals or by social institutions, but unmerited disadvantages in general, from whatever source they may arise. In American criminal trials, for example, before a murderer is sentenced, the law permits his unhappy childhood to be taken into account. Seldom is there any claim that the person murdered had anything to do with that presumptively unhappy childhood. In a notorious 1996 case in California, the victim was a 12-year-old girl who had not even been born when the murderer was supposedly going through his unhappy childhood. It is only from a cosmic perspective that his childhood had any bearing on the crime. If punishment is meant to deter crime, whether by example or by putting existing criminals behind bars or in the graveyard, then mitigating that punishment in pursuit of cosmic justice presumably means reducing the deterrence and allowing more crime to take place at the expense of innocent people. At a more mundane level, the enormously increased amount of time required to ponder the imponderables of someone else's childhood and related speculations means that the criminal justice system as a whole operates more slowly and that other criminals are therefore walking the streets on bail while awaiting trial in an overloaded court system. Prosecutors who should be moving on to other criminals after securing a murder conviction must instead spend additional time putting together a rebuttal to psychological speculation. Even if this speculation does not in the end affect the outcome in the case at hand, it affects other cases that are left in limbo while time and resources are devoted to rebutting unsubstantiated theories. A significant amount of the violent crimes committed in America is committed by career criminals who are walking the streets and stalking the innocent while awaiting trial. This, too, is one of the costs of the quest for cosmic justice. Much, if not most, of the concerns billed as social justice revolve around economic and social inequalities among groups. But the general principles involved are essentially the same as in other examples of pursuing cosmic justice. These principles have been proclaimed by politicians and by philosophers, from the soapbox to the seminar room and in the highest judicial chambers. Such principles deserve closer scrutiny and sharper definition. Meanings of Justice Back in the 1960s, President Lyndon Johnson made one of the classic statements of the vision of cosmic justice. You do not take a man who, for years, has been hobbled by chains, liberate him, and bring him to the starting line of a race, saying, You are free to compete with all others, and still justly believe you have been completely fair. Professor John Rawls's celebrated treatise, A Theory of Justice, puts the case more generally. According to Rawls, undeserved inequalities call for redress in order to produce genuine equality of opportunity. This is fair as opposed to formal equality of opportunity. In other words, having everyone play by the same rules or be judged by the same standards is merely formal equality, in Professor Rawls's view, while truly fair equality of opportunity means providing everyone with equal prospects of success from equal individual efforts. Note how the word fair has an entirely different meaning in this context. Cosmic justice is not about the rules of the game, 
It is about putting particular segments of society in the position that they would have been in, but for some undeserved misfortune. This conception of fairness requires that third parties must wield the power to control outcomes, overriding rules, standards, or the preferences of other people. Such attitudes are found from college admissions offices to the highest courts in the land. Thus, a long-time admissions director at Stanford University has said that she never required applicants to submit achievement test scores because requiring such tests could unfairly penalize disadvantaged students in the college admission process since such students, through no fault of their own, often find themselves in high schools that provide inadequate preparation for the achievement tests. Through no fault of their own one of the key phrases in the quest for cosmic justice. Nor are such attitudes unique to Stanford. They are, in fact, common across the country. In short, all are not to be judged by the same rules or standards within the given process. Pre-existing inequalities are to be counterbalanced. Note also that, once again, the quest for cosmic justice focuses on one segment of the population and disregards the interests of others who are not the immediate focus of discussion, but who nevertheless pay the price of the decisions made. After all, taxpayers and donors provide billions of dollars annually for the education of the next generation, but there is little or no sense of responsibility to them to maximize the productivity of the education they pay for, rather than engage in self-indulgent feel-goodism. Nor is there any concern for the effects on society as a whole in not putting educational resources where they will produce the largest return. Since undeserved inequalities extend beyond prejudicial decisions made by others to encompass biological differences among individuals or groups, the fact that women are usually not as large or as physically strong as men, for example, and profound differences in the geographical settings in which whole races and nations have evolved culturally, not to mention individual and group differences in child-rearing practices and moral values, cosmic justice requires, or assumes, vastly more knowledge than is necessary for traditional justice. Requirements for Cosmic Justice Implicit in much discussion of a need to rectify social inequities is the notion that some segments of society, through no fault of their own, lack things which others receive as windfall gains, through no virtue of their own. True as this may be, the knowledge required to sort this out intellectually, much less rectify it politically, is staggering and superhuman. Far from society being divided into those with a more or less standard package of benefits and others lacking those benefits, each individual may have both windfall advantages and windfall disadvantages, and the particular combination of windfall gains and losses varies enormously from individual to individual. Some are blessed with beauty but lacking in brains, some are wealthy but from an emotionally impoverished family, some have athletic prowess but little ability to get along with other human beings, and so on and on. Add to this the changing circumstances of each individual over a lifetime, with relative advantages and disadvantages changing with the passing years, and the difficulties of merely determining the net advantages increase exponentially. As just one example, a young woman of unusual beauty may gain many things, both personal and material, from her looks, without having to develop other aspects of her mind and character. Yet, when age begins to rob her of that beauty, she may be left much less able to cope than others who never had the benefit of her earlier windfall gain. The challenge of determining the net balance of numerous windfall advantages and disadvantages for one individual at one given time is sufficiently daunting. To attempt the same for whole broad-brush categories of people, each in differing stages of their individual life cycles in a complex and changing society, suggests hubris. Ironically, some find in the complexities of the world a reason to abandon fixed rules and standards in favor of individual fine-tuning. For example, a book seeking to justify racial preferences in college admissions was titled The Shape of the River 
because of a conversation on a river boat. You've got to know the shape of the river perfectly. It is all there is left to steer by on a very dark night. Do you mean to say that I've got to know all the million trifling variations of shape in the banks of this interminable river as well as I know the shape of the hall at home? On my honor, you've got to know them better. Can anyone seriously believe that college admissions officials can know individual applicants that well? Only by equating guesswork based on popular psychology and fashionable social theories with actual knowledge. Any riverboat which operated that way would have run aground long ago. Much of the quest for cosmic justice involves racial, regional, religious, or other categories of people who are to be restored to where they would be, but for various disadvantages they suffer from various sources. Yet each group tends to trail the long shadow of its own cultural history, as well as reflecting the consequences of external influences. The history of every people is a product of innumerable cross-currents, whose timing and confluence can neither be predicted beforehand nor always untangled afterward. There is no standard history that everyone has or would have had, but for peculiar circumstances of particular groups, whose circumstances can be corrected to conform to some norm. Unraveling all this in the quest for cosmic justice is a much more staggering task than seeking traditional justice. To apply the same rules to everyone requires no prior knowledge of anyone's childhood, cultural heritage, philosophical or sexual orientation, or the innumerable historical influences to which he or his forebears may have been subjected. If there are any human beings capable of making such complex assessments, they cannot be numerous. Put differently, the dangers of errors increase exponentially when we presume to know so many things and the nature of their complex interactions. In particular, it is all too easy to be overwhelmed by clear and tragic historic injustices and to glide easily from those injustices to a cause-and-effect explanation of contemporary problems. We know, of course, that causation and morality are two different things. Too often, however, we proceed as if we did not recognize this distinction. In the United States, for example, many of the social problems of the contemporary black underclass are almost automatically attributed to a legacy of slavery. The prevalence of fatherless families in the black ghettos, for example, has been widely explained by the lack of legally constituted families under slavery. But if one proceeds beyond plausibility and guilt to actually seek out the facts, an entirely different picture emerges. A hundred years ago, when blacks were just one generation out of slavery, the rate of marriage in the black population of the United States was slightly higher than that of the white population. Most black children were raised in two-parent families, even during the era of slavery, and for generations thereafter. The catastrophic decline of the black nuclear family began, like so many other social catastrophes in the United States, during the decade of the 1960s. Prior to the 1960s, the difference in marriage rates between black and white males was never as great as five percentage points. Yet today, that difference is greater than 20 percentage points and widening, even though the nuclear family is also beginning to decline among white Americans. Whatever the explanation for these changes, it lies much closer to today than to the era of slavery, however disappointing that may be to those who prefer to see social issues as moral melodramas. The tragic and monumental injustice of slavery has often been used as a causal explanation of other social phenomena, applying to both blacks and whites in the southern United States, where slavery was concentrated, without any check of the facts or comparisons with other and more mundane explanations. The fact that there are large numbers of black Americans today who are not in the labor force has also been one of those things, causally, and often rather casually, attributed to slavery. But again, if we go back a hundred years, we find that labor force participation rates among blacks were slightly higher than among whites, and remained so 
on past the middle of the twentieth century. If we want to know why this is no longer so, again we must look to events and trends much closer to our own time. For the white population as well, many observers of nineteenth-century America saw striking social and economic differences between southern whites and northern whites, the southerners having less education, poorer work habits, less entrepreneurship, more violence, and lower rates of invention, among other things. Even such astute observers as Alexis de Tocqueville attributed such differences to the adverse effects of slavery on the attitudes of southern whites. Yet, if one traces back to Britain the ancestors of these Southerners, one finds the very same social patterns in these and other things long before they crossed the Atlantic or saw the first black slave. Migrations from Britain, like migrations from many other countries, were from highly specific places in the country of origin to highly specific places in the country of destination. Most of the people who settled in the colony of Massachusetts, for example, came from within a sixty-mile radius of a town in East Anglia. Those who settled in the South came from different regions with very different cultural patterns. Moreover, the cultural contrasts between these people that many would later comment on in America had already been noted and commented on in Britain in earlier times, when these contrasts had nothing to do with slavery which did not exist in Britain at that time. We can all understand, in principle, that even a great historic evil does not automatically explain all other subsequent evils. But we often proceed in practice as if we did not understand that. Cancer can indeed be fatal, but it does not explain all fatalities, or even most fatalities. The larger point here is how easy it is to go wrong by huge margins when presuming to take into account complex historical influences. The demands of cosmic justice vastly exceed those of traditional justice and vastly exceed what human beings are likely to be capable of. The great U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said that there may be some people who are simply born clumsy so that they may inadvertently injure themselves or others, for which, presumably, they will not be blamed when they stand before the courts of heaven. But in the courts of man, they must be held to the same standards of accountability as everyone else. We do not have the omniscience to know who these particular people are, or to what extent they were capable of taking extra precautions to guard against their own natural tendencies. In other words, human courts should not presume to dispense cosmic justice. No small part of the legal shambles of the American criminal justice system since the 1960s, accompanied by skyrocketing rates of violent crime, resulted from attempts to seek cosmic justice in the courtrooms. In a series of U.S. Supreme Court decisions in the early 1960s, Various restrictions were placed on the police in their arrest and interrogation of suspects in criminal cases and in the search of their property. The rationales for these restrictions included the claim, undoubtedly true, that inexperienced and amateurish criminals, ignorant of the law, were more likely to make admissions that would later prove to be fatally damaging to their own legal defense, while sophisticated professional criminals and members of organized crime syndicates were far less likely to trap themselves in this way. Clearly this is an injustice from some cosmic perspective, and correcting this inequity among criminals was explicitly the perspective of the Attorney General of the United States and of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at that time. However, as in other instances of the quest for cosmic justice, the costs to third parties were largely disregarded, pretended not to exist, or dismissed with some such lofty phrase as, That is the price we pay for freedom. Presumably the United States was not a free country until the 1960s. A more recent cause celeb of the American criminal justice system was the murder trial of former football star O.J. Simpson, which provoked widespread consternation, not only because of its not guilty verdict in the face of massive evidence to the contrary, but also because of the sheer length of time that the trial took. It was more than a year after the murder itself before the trial concluded, 
even though Simpson was arrested within days after the body of his former wife was discovered. Those who take on the daunting task of defending the current American criminal justice system were quick to claim that it was the defendant's wealth, celebrity, and race which made the trial so long, as well as the verdict so unexpected, thereby making the case too atypical to be part of a general indictment of the American criminal justice system. However, an even longer time elapsed in another contemporary murder case in which none of these factors was present, even though that suspect was likewise arrested not long after that crime. Nearly three years elapsed between the murder of 12-year-old Polly Kloss in 1993 and the sentencing of her murderer, Richard Allen Davis, in 1996, even though there was such evidence against the killer that there was not even a claim made by his defense attorney that Davis had not committed the crime. What could have taken so long, then? Among other things, there were extended arguments over all sorts of legal technicalities, technicalities created not by legislation, but by the judicial interpretations of appellate courts, seeking to remove ever more remote dangers of injustice by creating the greater injustice of crippling a society's ability to defend itself in even the clearest cases of unquestioned guilt. Merit and Cosmic Justice Related to cosmic justice is the seductive, misleading, and often pernicious concept of merit, which is either explicit or implicit in much that is said by people in various parts of the philosophical spectrum. A man born to ignorant, abusive, immoral, and drug-ridden parents may exhibit great personal merit in becoming nothing more than an honest and sober laborer who supports his family and raises his children to be decent and upright citizens, while another man, born to the greatest wealth and privilege and educated in the finest schools, may exhibit no greater personal merit in becoming a renowned scientist, scholar, or entrepreneur. Indeed, would most of us not rejoice more to see such a laborer win millions of dollars in a lottery than we would to see this scientist, scholar, or entrepreneur gain millions because of his proficiency in his chosen field? Have religious people not for centuries held out the hope that humble but decent people would someday receive a more transcendent reward in a better world after death? It does not matter that some leaders may have held out such hopes cynically in order to reconcile people to their painful fate in this world, for such cynicism works only because it resonates with a feeling that is genuine in others. For some, it is but a short step from wishing that personal merit were rewarded, here and now, to promoting policies designed either to do so, or simply to redistribute wealth in general, on grounds that much or most of that wealth is unmerited by those who currently hold it. Tales about princes and paupers who were mistakenly switched at birth, or about servants living downstairs who have as much or more character as their wealthy employers living upstairs, all resonate with the idea that many factors besides personal merit determine our economic and social fates. No doubt this belief is true to a very considerable extent, certainly to a greater extent than many of us would wish. But again, the question is not what we would do if we were God on the first day of creation, or how we would judge souls if we were God on Judgment Day. The question is, what lies within our knowledge and control, given that we are only human, with all the severe limitations which that implies? One of the many differences between human beings and God on Judgment Day is that God does not have to worry about what is going to happen the day after Judgment Day. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette.